Well, thank you again, Elaine. Why don't we, uh, why don't we just stand up for a second, turn around, or turn to your side, and just say hi to someone. Just say hi to someone quickly, greet someone, maybe who you haven't seen in a while. <laughs> Morning, Preston. Morning, Blair. Nice to see you. Good, good. Good morning. Good morning. Not to, not to ignore Shirley. <laughs> oh, sorry. I turned my mic off. Yes. <laughs> okay, we can come grab a seat. That's always the danger, isn't it? We could go on forever, Gilda says, yeah. We'll, we'll continue this after the, uh, after the service. Uh, I mentioned earlier about camp ministry happening, and Elizabeth and I, through our, through our married life, and even uh, separately when we were well, pre, pre-marriage, uh, before we were married, we, we have been camp people. We have loved uh, being involved in camp ministry. And one of the, uh, the camps that's memorable for me was one of the first time I spoke at a children's camp. This was in Alberta, uh, north of Edmonton. And I did this little thing on the first night where I had these little kids, you know, a chapel full of little kids. And I said, okay, I want to get to know your name. So on the count of three, tell me your name. And of course, they all shouted out their name. And uh, I turned to this little girl right in front of me. She caught my attention because she was so cute. <laughs> she was so sweet. And I said, and what is your... I got everybody's name, but I didn't get your name. What's your name? And she said, Alexandria. Now, the rest of the story is, if you know our oldest daughter's name, I said to Elizabeth, we need to name our oldest, our first daughter. If we ever have a daughter, can we please name her Alexandria. <laughs> I had a favorite at camp that week, I must confess. Now, no harm was done. But favoritism is something that the Bible warns about. And favoritism is something that can be harmful. In fact, if you look at the story of the patriarchs, you don't have to read into the Bible too far to find that Isaac was the favored son of Sarah. And Isaac, well, he, he had a, a favored son. He was married to Rebekah. Isaac's favorite son was Esau, because Esau could go out and hunt wild game and make him a good stew. But his wife, Rebecca, well, she really favored Jacob of their, of their twin sons. So Jacob grew up as the favored son. He had two wives, Leah and Rachel. His favorite wife was Rachel. And his favorite sons were the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. And as we read those stories, we see that there was heartache, there was uh, deceitfulness, there was lying, there was even attempted murder because of favoritism. And so there's no wonder that James warns against favoritism. So I'm going to invite Jacob Stewart to come up this morning and uh, do our reading for us from James chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 13. Good morning, everyone. So, as Pastor Paul just said, I will be reading from James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a golden ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, But say to the poor man, you stand there, or please sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judge with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brother and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich that are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming to noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the law 
and yet stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do one, if you don't commit one, but you commit adultery, <laughs> oh sorry, I read that again. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. The word of the Lord. Well, as we've been uh, going through the book of James, we found through chapter 1 that three themes emerged in that book. Those three themes would be uh, the theme of, uh, of trials and temptations, the theme of wisdom, and the theme of uh, riches and poverty. And those three themes, actually, as we continue on through the book of James, we'll see those three themes coming up over and over again. And so chapter 2 uh, begins with that third of those three themes, the theme of... Uh, of riches and poverty. And James begins, he, he comes right in and he starts speaking to his audience, his dear brothers and sisters, and he warns, warns them against favoritism. He feels very strongly about this clearly, and he gives them this hypothetical situation. It's this hypothetical situation. It's a little bit exaggerated. This rich person with this fancy rich uh, gold ring, it's almost like uh, literally he's saying like the finger itself that the ring sat on was made of gold, and the poor person is wearing uh, decrepit clothing, torn clothing, and, and James is warning them that if you are kowtowing to the rich, if you are showing them favoritism, it is as if you are dis being discriminatory, you are becoming a judge. And, and, and so James feels very strongly, as an audience uh, that he's writing to, largely people who would have been uh, experiencing some form of poverty, he is questioning, why are you doing this? And he's warning against it. And then he goes in uh, through the bulk of the passage from verses 5 down, and he gives them three reasons why this is not a good idea. And the first thing he says in verse 5, he says, Has not God chosen those who are poor uh, in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? So the first, thing he re the first reason that, um, that James is giving for not to show favoritism is this, that favoritism of the rich is inconsiderate with God's choosing of the poor. And we find this idea uh, in the Old Testament, this idea that God has chosen the poor. Isaiah 61 is a, is a passage that, um, that we can be very familiar with. I think we'll see it here. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom, freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Now, you might be quite familiar with this passage because these are the words that Jesus himself recited when he inaugurated his, his ministry in the temple. And we find that in the, in the Gospel of Luke. These are the words that Jesus was quoting for himself as his, at his own inauguration. But as you read that, as you think this through a little bit, you might be asking, James tell us, tells us not to show favoritism, but is God in some way showing favoritism to the poor, you know, kind of what, what, it, what is that about? Well, I think we can think of it like this. I mentioned Teen Challenge coming to us uh, uh, early June, on June the 5th. We can understand that when we hear the stories, the testimonies that are going to be shared uh, by, the, by the people in this program, that we respond to their vulnerability. We respond to the vulnerability of people who open up their hearts to us, people who are marginalized in some way, whether it be from addictions or poverty or whatever, whatever it is. We respond to that. We respond to stories of vulnerability. And this is God responding to the vulnerable. God has a heart that is soft towards those who are marginalized in some way. God's desire is for restoration. God's desire is for justice. The Bible talks about justice quite a bit, and there's two understandings of justice we find in the Bible. There would be, first of all, what we would understand maybe commonly when we think about justice as, as a retributive justice. Retributive justice was on display last week when this young man, this Russian soldier, Vadim Shishimin, Shishimarin, this young man was brought to justice. This young man, 21 years old, who killed an innocent 62-year-old man riding his bicycle. 
shot him in cold blood. He's been brought to justice. Now, as an aside, you might look at that young man and think, what is the story going on there? There's probably, he is in maybe some ways his own victim of, of an unjust system and corruption and, and a victim himself. But he's been brought to justice. This is retributive justice. He is going to be punished for life for what he did to that man. But the Bible mostly talks about, and Tim Keller would say, that 90% of the uh, descriptions of justice in the Bible are of a different form. They would be of what we would call restorative justice, where God seeks to restore those who are being harmed. Theologians talk about the quartet of the poor that we find in the Old Testament. These are the orphans and the widows and the immigrants and the poor who we might understand as economically and socially marginalized. Uh, the classic example that we know from Scripture in the New Testament is the lepers. These would be the people who God would understand as the quartet of the poor. So the poor are vulnerable, but we also understand that the poor may be most responsive to God. Now, it's not automatic. It's not that every poor person in their poverty is going to respond to God out of his mercy towards them. But God understands that people in their vulnerability, when he extends mercy to them, are more likely to be responsive to God than those who are rich. Because they're of their great need, they're going to recognize their great need for mercy versus those, versus those who are self-sufficient, who are, don't recognize their own need, who feel no need for God's mercy. Now, this might raise another question for you. Um, you know, if the, if the poor are going to be more vulnerable, uh, sorry, if the poor are going to be more responsive to God, does that mean that the poor uh, should remain poor? Like, is that the better condition? Is that some sort of, sort of a preferred state that we should keep people who are poor, poor, because they may be responsive to God? Well, clearly, the answer to that is no. Now, when you hear that question, you might think about uh, a word from Jesus that he spoke the night before he died, you might remember Jesus was in the house of his good friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and a woman came along and anointed his head for burial. She poured a very expensive perfume all over his hair. And the disciples became quite indignant about this. This was an expensive perfume, and they said, could not that perfume, could not it have been sold and the money being given to the poor? And Jesus responds with, the poor you will always have with you. I remember years ago as a social work student, a university professor taking those words of Jesus and mocking Christianity because of that. The poor you will always have with you. The Christians don't care about the poor. They're always going to be here. They're not going to do anything to change the conditions of the poor. And of course, that professor didn't understand the context in which Jesus was saying that. And maybe sometimes we don't fully understand the context of that either. When Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you, he's referring to a passage from Deuteronomy chapter 15. And in Deuteronomy 15, uh, God is uh, instructing the people of Israel about how they are going to live in the land. And he introduces this thing called the, uh, the year of Jubilee, that if people are in any way living in debt, that after every seven years you are to cancel the debt of those people. And so, uh, God, God says in, in verse 4 of chapter 15, however, there need be no poor people among you. So he's, he's given instruction about how to treat those who are in debt, how to treat those who are poor. But he also says, however, there need be no poor because the land that I am giving you is so prosperous, it is so bountiful, it is so rich that there's enough for everybody. So if you just live the way that I have called you to live, if you are just treat each other fairly, if you share the resources that you have, there is enough for you, not only for enough for you, but there is enough that you can export your goods and you'll be in debt to no nation. There is so much here. I'm being so generous to you if you will only live the way that I have called you to live in generosity and fairness and sharing. There'll be enough for everybody. But God knows the hearts of his people. And so further down in the passage, he says what seems to be a contradiction. He says, there need to be no poor among you. But if anyone is poor among you, your fellow Israelites, he says. And so he goes on to make concessions because he knows the heart of his people, that they won't live according to the ways that he has called them to. 
And so it comes down to verse 11, this word, these words that Jesus quoted. Therefore, or there will always be poor people in the land. So when Jesus says these words, the poor will always be among you, he's not talking about some preferred state that we have poor people. He's just understanding the reality of the world that we live in, a broken world where there will be poverty because we are given over to greed and selfishness and self-protection and care for ourselves and not care for our neighbors. So no, that is not God's preferred idea. But God does understand, and he has a soft heart, as we feel it ourselves, towards those who are vulnerable, who expose their weakness, and are soft towards God. God is soft towards them as well. So the first thing, so just to review that, because uh, I think I covered a lot there, going back and forth to different scriptures. The first point is this, is that James, uh, let me go back to, James says the first, the first reason why we are not to show favoritism is because God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith. God understands that the poor are more likely to be responsive to, to them and they will be rich in their faith as they do so. The second thing is that favoritism, James says, is inconsistent with the behavior of the rich. Verses 6 and 7, James talks about the, uh, how they, uh, the, the, the people are kowtowing to the rich for their own benefit. They seem to be seeking their own benefit, yet these are the rich who are exploiting them, they are dragging them into court, they are blaspheming the name of Jesus. They are exploiting them. They seem to be landowners, uh, they seem to be um, who are exploiting them or maybe who, who they have some sort of debt to, so they're taking them into court to get the debt paid off. We should understand here that when James is um, talking about the rich here, even in the earlier passage, he's not necessarily talking about Christians who are rich, but he's talking about just generally people who are rich and are exploitive in their practices towards those who are poor. And yet the people are sort of somehow out of their own selfish gain uh, uh, or maybe seeking special favor of the rich or are, um, are, 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 are kowtowing to them. You're kind of coming up to them hoping to get some sort of special favor. The, uh, he even says that they are blaspheming, blaspheme, the, the rich are blasph blaspheming the name of God. We could, the, uh, the idea there is that before Christians started to wear the name Christians as, as a self-description. It was a name that was used against them. It was an insult to be called a Christian. And so the rich would be talking to those who were followers of Jesus from a Jesus community, would be calling them Christians in a uh, blasphemous way, in an insulting way. And yet these people are seeking their favor in some way. They're showing favoritism to the, towards their own oppressors. In a, uh, in a beautiful novel written by Eugene Yelchin, a uh, children's novel called Breaking Stalin's Nose, the author who grew up in Russia under the Soviet regime talks about what it was like um, under the Stalin regime. And he gives the story of this boy named Sasha uh, whose father was apparently you know, a strong communist. And this boy was growing up and he was looking forward to the day where he was going to be able to wear his red ribbon and be recognized as a young communist. That was his desire. But what the author does here is he shows us that the, the method of Stalin was to create in seeds of suspicion among the people. So rather than people banding together, people living under oppression banding together to oppose the way of life and the rule of the, of the governing authorities, he has actually, what Stalin did so successfully was to create suspicion. So the people were snitching on each other. And he tells the story of how this boy Sasha's father, who he, Sasha looked up to his father as his hero, believed that he was this good, strong communist, was arrested one night because a neighbor snitched on him. And that neighbor, what did he want? He wanted the room that this boy and his father lived in because it was a bigger room. And that was kind of the way of life, is that people were suspicious of one another, snitching on one another, lack of trust. They were kowtowing to the powerful, to the authorities for their own benefit. And this is what James is describing here, is that the poor are kowtowing to the rich for their own benefit. They're seeking favor selfishly. 
So he's saying favoritism is inconsistent with the behavior of the rich. And then thirdly, favor is inconsistent with the, with the rule of love. So he talks about the royal law found in Scripture in verse 8. Love your neighbor as yourself. We've looked at this passage over the past few weeks, but I'm going to read uh, a bit to you from Romans chapter 13, another reference to this passage of loving your neighbor. We haven't looked at this before. Paul talks about it in Romans 8, or sorry, Romans 13, verse 8. You're welcome to turn to your Bible and follow along. He says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Further down towards 9 and 10. Love the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So what's the third reason why we are not to uh, show favoritism to the rich while oppressing the poor? Because it is a violation of the great commandment, a violation of the commandment that God has given to us. Love does no harm to a neighbor, but when we favor the rich at the, uh, at the expense of the poor, we are hurting our neighbors. We are aligning ourselves with the rich and powerful at the expense of the law of love. So what are we to do about this? How are we to live our lives? Maybe our situation is not exactly the situation that James is describing here uh, to the church that he was writing to. So we need to understand how are we to live in a way that we are not somehow showing favoritism toward other people so that we are not causing destruction and harm and broken relationships in the way that we live by showing favoritism in a way that brings uh, you know, that has some sort of a selfish pursuit to it. So I want to say this. Uh, a couple of suggestions, one of them with a, a few bullet points below it. Okay? So the first suggestion is this. We need to take an honest look at our lives and ask ourselves, in what way and in what relationships might we be prone to show favoritism? And so the first of these is to examine, what about our consumer choices? We live in this global uh, global, this world of globalization where um, large corporations have the potential uh, to, 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 to have exploitive and abusive practice towards, practices towards their employees. Now, this isn't an anti-capitalist rant <laughs> by any means, it's a, but it's a human system. It's a human system run by humans, and it's prone to exploitation because it's run by people who are... Um, like all of us, are prone towards greed and selfish ambition. So we need to look at our own practices. What are our consumption practices? Are we kowtowing to the rich for favor, for cheap clothing, for cheap articles? And are we doing that at the expense of the poor? <sighs> That's overwhelming, isn't it? Like, what do we even do about that? We're just a small minion in this great global world, what can we even do? And my suggestion is that you do something. You make one change to the way that you live, to your consumption practices. Perhaps you say, it's going to be coffee, and I'm going to choose to buy, maybe it's the Lacenda coffee that we promote, which pr supports small-scale farmers in Guatemala, and the profits go towards children's Christian education. Maybe that's the change you're going to make, rather than the large corporations where you don't know the practices and the treatment of farmers and the, and the, and the uh, treatments of the environment that they're required to, to, to live by, you make that little change. Say, I'm going to purchase my coffee from this coffee producer or this roaster. Or perhaps it's an art article of clothing, and you're going to say, I'm only going to buy my sweaters from this company because I know that they will go and they'll plant 10 trees for every sweater that I buy. Elizabeth and I had a conversation about this recently saying maybe the rule that we live by is less is more. So we have less items of clothing that may cost us a little bit more but we know that the, uh, there's going to be a social benefit by buying these items of clothing. We, we know that this corporation, this business is transparent with their practices and we can understand the benefit of that. Or perhaps, this is going a little bit uh, off, off of that topic a little bit, but what if it is just that we are known to be generous tippers? 
That always, hasn't always been the case, sadly, has it? You know, the, so what, if it, what if the Sunday lunch crowd was known to be generous to their servers? What if it was that little change that we could make in our life? Are there things that we can do in our consumer choices, in the relationships that we have, uh, with the consumption relationships that we have? The second would be, what about the relationships that we have with others? Do we judge people by what they can do for us rather than by what we can do for them? Do some people make us look better? Are there people who we think might advance our careers or who might advance our professional pursuits? Are there people who we uh, are tied to because of the connections that they have, the people that they know, and we prefer them, we show favoritism toward them because of the way that they can benefit us rather than the ways that we can serve others? Are there decisions that we're making? Are there just people who are easier for us to get along with? Do we have preferred children? Do we have preferred neighbors? Do we, are we, uh, do we have preferred students or campers? In whatever context we find, because they are just ease, they make our life easier. Are there ways, are there ways that we are showing favoritism to people in our social relationships? If that's the case, what can we do about that? Well, we can remember that everyone is made in the image of God. Everyone is made in the image of God. And we exist to serve others, but not to be served by others. Everyone is made in God's image, and we are here to serve, not to be served by others. And just to bring it a bit closer to home, what about our relationships here as a community in the church? Do we show favoritism by simply talking only to the people that we know because we're more comfortable with that? We're afraid to go out of that kind of our comfort zone. Are we showing favoritism in that way by not reaching out to the people who we haven't met before? In what way are we maybe guilty of favoritism in that way? Do we show favoritism to those who we might suspect are coming into our building and they're bringing with them gifts and talents and potential resources? that will make our worship better or that will make our, our preaching better or make our building better, are we then kowtowing to them, showing favoritism to them? Are we guilty of such practices? If that's the case, what can we do? We can be brave. We can do one hard thing. We can reach out to the person we haven't spoken to before. We can invite someone for a coffee or for a walk and get to know them in ways that we can't get to know them on a Sunday morning. And then also, we can confess our tendencies. We have a tendency to do these things. We're all guilty in some ways of being more comfortable with others, with one group of people than with others. We're all guilty of this. And so we confess to God our tendency to show favoritism to one group over the other, to one individual over the other. Verses 12 and 13, as Paul wraps up, or sorry, as James wraps up this passage, he speaks about um, mercy, judgment and mercy. We need mercy. We need to confess that we often pursue selfish interests instead of selfless interests. And G James promises mercy Mercy triumphs over judgment, but we only receive mercy when we seek mercy, when we seek God's mercy. That's how James closes the passage. When James opens the passage, on this passage where he's saying, we are not to show favoritism, we are not to distinguish between one another, we are not to judge between one another or discriminate against one another. James actually opens the passage by distinguishing between two we might say people. He distinguishes between us, his brothers and sisters, and the glorious Lord Jesus. He distinguishes between us and God because we are people in need of God's mercy. The glorious Lord Jesus, when he says the glorious Lord Jesus, he's, de he's describing that Jesus is the image of God, and we are people in need of mercy. The mercy of the glorious Lord Jesus. So as we do every week, we want to remember the mercy of the glorious Lord Jesus. And I'm going to invite Luke to come up and to lead us in a thought for communion.